All righty. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Joanne and Jordan, for leading us in a time of worship. Resurrection Sunday, always the uh, um, one of the most special uh, Sundays that uh, we enjoy as uh, Christians. Um, I was texting someone earlier this week, and uh, we got onto the old hymns, if you remember the old hymns. And I texted uh, one of the lines from one of the old hymns up, or low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, coming again, the new day, Jesus my Lord. And then up from the grave he arose. Do you remember that old song? I don't know how many of you remember that, but I appreciate the songs that Joanne led this morning. Take out your teaching sheets this morning. That t- Today's message is um, something that I have pondered for a couple of weeks, knowing that I had uh, the two Sundays to talk about a risen Savior, but it's entitled... Um, the resurrection positive uh, possibilities and uh, that's some of the things that I really like positive uh, options possibilities in my life and when we think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ that certainly um, uh, brings to mind many 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 possibilities I love the overhead and the the logo not the logos but the backdrop that John used this morning with the Three crosses there. Uh, we have three crosses out in our yard, but when we think about the cross of Christ and how he conquered death by uh, laying down his life freely on the cross, but rising again, it just is uh, very uplifting. So this morning I want to take a, a little time and talk, uh, talk on uh, mainly four points of these possibilities. They, they go in, the, there's an endless number of possibilities, but I've kind of handpicked four of my favorites. But as we get started, I want to remind you that the resurrection of Jesus paves the way for a life filled with these positive positive possibilities. And in the book of John, the 20th chapter, we have four Gospels with the account of Resurrection Sunday, but I'm using John, John's account out of uh, John 20, 1 through 18. Follow along as I read these verses because it is the backdrop of Resurrection Sunday. So, Scripture records there in 1 through 18, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one who loved, uh, whom Jesus loved. And she said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciples outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and he looked in and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings laying there. The cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. From then on, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus, that, uh, that said Jesus must rise from the dead. And then they went home. Continuing on, we see uh, Mary, um, there's a, a few verses here that talks about how Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene in verse seven, uh, verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying and she wept. She stopped and she looked in. She saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, please tell me where you have put him. I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned and cried out, 
Rabboni, which in Hebrew means teacher. Verse 17, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father, your Father, my God, and to your God. And Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. Once again, there's many, many times in the Bible as I read through it that I would have liked to have been in person there. And this would have been one of those super, super uh, incredibly um, exciting experiences just to have been uh, hanging there around the tomb, the front of the tomb, or there inside the tomb, seeing the angels or seeing Jesus talk to Mary. Incredible, um, incredible story. And once again, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is very exciting because it demonstrates the power of God and his deep love for all of us, that he would, what, send his son to die on the cross for our sins. And uh, this morning, when we think about the positive possibilities, I'd like to um, present these four things. On your handouts here, there's a few p uh, fill in the blanks. But number one, the first possibility, and I love this, is that we can be pardoned. Everybody say pardoned. Pardoned. We can be pardoned. Write that down. We can be pardoned. And uh, I love this because it really represents it. We can be uh, simply forgiven of our sin. You and I are sinners, and we're, we, are, we can be forgiven of our sin. Um, as we know, our situation is we are all born into sin. We have a sin nature in, in us. We don't have to look very far to see that nature rise its ugly head, even the uh, one-year-old, the two-year-old, the three-year-olds that we have running around the church we see these little kids and we, we say, oh my, what, how, how, how do they act the way they do? Well, it's a sin nature and uh, it's amazing that we're born into sin. We are in fact sinners by nature and then also by our daily decisions. The decisions that you and I make, we realize that, wow, um, not all of them are correct and godly, and they're, they're sinful in so many ways. But we see that the death of Jesus and him freely laying down his life, it was in response for the forgiveness, the remission, or the pardoning of our sins. You see, sin has a price to be paid. Um, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. We look back at the Old Testament. We see the lamb that represented um, the forgiveness when the lamb was shed, uh, uh, killed and the blood was shed, it, it provided a forgiveness of sin. And Jesus is, in fact, what? The Lamb of God. So he pays the price for our sins. He pays the way, paves the way for us to be, what? Pardoned. And um, the amazing thing is, is it's a good thing because you and I can't do that on our, on our own. Um, Hey, Ruth, could you hand um, Christy uh, and the others that came in late uh, some handouts? Great. You guys can follow along, fill in the blanks here. And I like this, what I wrote down here. A pardon is the action of forgiving or being forgiven for an error or an offense. An error or an offense. The idea is that this pardon provides this forgiveness. I like what uh, the psalmist wrote in Psalms 103, verses 2, 3, and 4. Lots of psalms that uh, David penned, but I like this because you can sense the heartfelt uh, feeling that David had about forgiveness. He writes this. You can follow along there on your handout. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he writes, who forgives all your sins and heals all your disease, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Boy, that verse has a whole bunch of stuff in there. But the best thing that is there is that it's the forgiveness of our sins. He forgives us of our sins. 
not only does the Old Testament and the Psalms talk about forgiveness, in the New Testament, it's brought out in numerous um, teachings of, of the apostles. Not only do the Gospels record uh, what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, just like on those beginning verses, he died on the cross, but he rose again. The Apostle Paul teaches um, he teaches individuals about the importance of forgiveness of sin. Um, I can't read you the entire chapter of uh, the book of Acts, the 13th chapter, but it's an amazing chapter. If you <laughs> just had to pick one chapter out of um, the book of Acts, uh, along with chapter 2, <laughs> the Holy Spirit, but uh, chapter 13 gives a little backdrop of, of the importance of the history of the people of God and then Jesus coming to die on the cross. In, in, um, in Acts 13, 38, um, uh, it has this verse here. Before I, I get to that, just let me give you a little back, backdrop. Um, Paul and, and Barnabas are preaching in a city called Antioch, and he's there talking to a group of individuals, and um, they, were, um, they were by birth, they were Jews, and he's explaining to them, boy, God has really blessed the Jewish people. Matter of fact, when you look at the Jewish people, they, they were called of God, and then they, 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 they multiplied when they went into Egypt. God blessed them uh, incredibly. I mean, Joseph and the whole story of how he provided for his family. But over the course of a number of years, um, even in the hard times, God continued to bless them and multiply them. They had cattle and they had children and they had possessions. And then finally, God led them out of Egypt. And we know that story. He said, Moses, lead my people out. And we know the story of Exodus. And uh, then as they're getting prepared to, to go into the promised land for a, for a number of years, uh, we talked about this a while back, God's teaching them the ways uh, that he wants them to live. And we see blessing after blessing. Finally, they get into the promised land. The promised land was promised, and they go in. And over the course of time, over the course of about 450 years, the people of God began to conquer towns and cities in Canaan, the promised land, seven in total. And you can see the, the blessing of God on these people. Then the Bible records how there were kings that, um, or judges that ruled over the people so they could live orderly. And then there were kings. And in that line of kings, it was David. I mentioned him a moment ago, King David. And from his, um, I say loins, but his lineage comes Jesus Christ. An amazing progression of the things of God and how Jesus shows up. Then we see in the New Testament... Who's the crazy guy that had the fur on his back and ate locusts? John the Baptist. And what was he doing? He was proclaiming, blessed is he who's coming. It's Jesus. And he gets to baptize Jesus. So Jesus now comes on the scene. And he spends a number of uh, three years teaching his disciples how we are to live as Christians, as followers of Christ. And then after three and a half years, what happened? He goes to the cross of Calvary. He freely gives his life. He dies on the cross for what? For our sin, for our forgiveness. The best part of that is after three days, what happens? We're celebrating it this morning, Resurrection Sunday. The best part is, is he, from the, from the power of God, he's raised from the dead. And in a minute, I'll read a scripture saying that now he's, Alive, seated at the right hand of God, praying for you and I. That's a big picture of what happened. So Paul explains this to the people in Antioch in 13 and verse 38. Listen to this because it's so very important. He states this, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness is of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Isn't that great? Everyone who simply believes is set free from every sin. And that's what the Christian experience is about. By 
by accepting Jesus, his forgiveness, his pardoning of our sins. And we do that by simply believing. It's a step of faith. Paul goes on to say, free from every sin, a justification that you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. You see, he's talking to these people. You couldn't do it back then. You were trying to go through these hoops. All these hoops, by the way, were pointing to Jesus. All of, of the rituals and, and the meals and the celebrations that we see in the Old Testament all pointing to Jesus. But somehow along the way, the Jewish people lost sight of, of really who Jesus was. Do you remember just last week we talked about how Jesus came into Jerusalem and they were waving palm fronds. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were singing his praises, but a few days later, what? They were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. The Jewish people, they got lost somehow, some way. Thankfully today, more and more are coming back to realize that, you know, Jesus is the Messiah and we're thankful for that. But once again, I like this verse in 3, 13, verse 38. Jesus, uh, through Jesus, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. Let me go on to number two of four things that I have as possibilities in the idea of the resurrection. Number two, we can possess peace. Write down um, possess peace. And I like this point. Because in our life today, there is so much lacking, but the majority of the time, the, the key thing that is lacking is peace. When you talk to individuals, hey, how you doing? Hey, I tell you what, I'm, I'm kind of stressed out. <laughs> I'm a little anxious. I got this going, I got that going. And I get that. But there's a lack of peace in our society today, in our families today, in our friends' families today. The opposite of peace is stress and anxiety, or better said, the absence of stress and anxiety is peace. And I put that in bold in there. Uh, put a little circle around it, put some doves, put a heart, do a smiley face or whatever your mode is. And you see, when we look at our lives, we look at our experiences and and the, depending on the situations that we face, we have stress and anxiety that just abounds. Um, I describe it like this. Um, I'm not a surfer. I have uh, body surfed and I boogie board. But I have uh, two, um, actually Elijah surfs, but my son, Nathan, and his wife, Alicia, who live in, in Hawaii, they surf all the time. And when we go out there, we watch and surf, and uh, uh, they love surfing. I think it's a great sport, but I, um, I equate this idea of peace and how it comes and goes in our life, I equate it to the idea of surfing. They say that when you're on a surfboard and you're waiting uh, for the waves to come, it's called you're waiting for a set. A set is a group of waves that come. And there's times when nothing's happening and you're just sitting on your board and enjoying the, the sunshine. But then this set comes in. And before you know it, the waves are breaking. And some larger than, than others, it gets really crazy. And that's how it is with the, our, our lives. There's times when everything seems to be fine. And for some unknown reason, boom, all of a sudden we're filled with anxiety. We're filled with stress. Uh, I have another analogy um, that I like. It's, it's the seasons of life. Um, what do we have in the seasons of life? We have uh, spring, summer, um, autumn, and winter. You know, here in San Diego, we just went through what I call, or what I felt like, it was a very brutal, <laughs> if you're listening back east, you're going to laugh at this, but a brutal winter. It was cold and it was wet. But everyone that lives in San Diego knows that the last three months have been cold and wet. Look at my backyard. I didn't go out there once in three months because my knees hurt because I, it, was, it was cold. My knees get bad when they're cold, when it's cold. And the weeds are everywhere. Why? Because we had so much rain. 
but seasons, the winter came, but now I love being outside. Why? The spring is here. And just like seasons, they come and they go. There's times when it's cold and wet, when it's dark and dreary, when it's filled with stress and anxiety. But it doesn't, it's not going to be like that always. There's times when the springtime comes and the summer days come and you take a nap under, under the, the tree on the hammock. Those are the days and the idea of the seasons and coming and going. And that's how I equate peace. Peace uh, comes a, 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 and we need to realize that it's not, um, there's going to be times when it's not totally peaceful. Um, there's a, there's a saying I'd like to uh, bring out. Do not try this at home. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? When you see something on TV and it's like crazy and, and you say, yeah, I think I'll do that at home. No, do not try this at home. Or a danger label on, on some cleaner or, or for a child's toy. Do not da, da 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 Do not do this. Do not touch this. Caution, caution, caution. That's what I think about when I think about peace. Do not... Try and live life without the idea of having peace, obtaining peace. Trying to live without peace, the peace of God, is so dangerous. Why do I say that? Because I've done that. I've experienced living uh, for a period of time without focusing on having the peace of God. Um, I I have a daughter-in-law that's um, in medicine. She's actually a, a pharmacist. And she's not a doctor, but she knows the, this term. You might even know it, but um, uh, this term, the silent killer. What is the silent killer? Anybody know? Diabetes. What is it? Diabetes, Diabetes is not is uh, a killer, but it's not the silent killer. High blood pressure, they say, is the silent killer because you don't know you have it. You don't even know you have high blood pressure. But what it does, and that's why the doctors, when you go in for a checkup, they say, oh, your blood pressure's high. Here, you got to take one of these every day with your vitamins, <laughs> right? Why? Because it's a silent, you don't even know that you have it. And the, si- the silent killer, it, uh, uh, it, it puts you at risk for heart disease and for, for heart failure and for stroke. And before you know it, your ticker's going bad and you're incapacitated. That's what I equate the lack of peace. It's a silent killer. You don't even know that 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 you're peace, you're unpeaceful because you're you're trying to just get through life. But when you become anxious or stressful, just stop for a moment and realize, hey, I remember what Pastor was preaching about on that Sunday morning, the absence of peace. I like this uh, in John sixteen thirty three. It's on your hand out there. I have told you these things. Jesus is talking. Uh, to his followers, hey, it's it's not every day is not going to be a, a a walk in the park. You're going to have problems. How many of you experience that? Even as a Christian, oh, you accept Jesus, everything's going to be good. I almost said hunky dory, but that ages me. Everything is going to be great, <laughs> but no, every day is not so great, and and life is hard. Life is difficult. The other day I was listening to Caleb on the radio and there was three songs in a row. I, I could hardly believe it, but I guess the songs are being written and speak to the, the culture of today, how hard life is. And uh, maybe it's because I'm older and I've kind of learned some of the things that I'm talking about. Yeah, life is hard, but you learn to manage it and you understand that life is hard. So here's Jesus talking to his fathers. Hey guys, It's not always going to be a walk in the the garden. It's not always going to be sweet smelling. He says this, I have told you these things in 33 of John 16, so that you may have peace. He says all of this to help them to understand, even in the midst of your crazy, anxious, stressful life, you can have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. How do we know that Jesus has overcome the world? You know, he's teaching before he dies. He teaches this to his followers. But let me tell you what, this morning, we have proof that he has what? Overcome the world. He died on the cross. He was buried. After three days, he what? 
He rose again. That's the resurrection Sunday that we get to celebrate today. So we can take him, not just because he said it way back then. He has, we have living proof. Three of four points this morning, talking about uh, life, our life, um, the resurrection of Jesus paves the way in our life with these positive possibilities. Number three, I love this one. We have access to power. Well, that's a good one, Pastor. If I was writing the sermon, I'd write that too. Jesus rose from the grave. We have access to power. Well, uh, uh, access to power, power, it's, it's an ability to live a life uh, that is honoring to God. That's what we want to do. We accept him. We want to live a, a good life, a life that's honoring to God. And yet, there's a problem. Yes, we have salvation. We have eternity to look forward to. But day in and day out, how do we live a life that's honoring to God? You and I both know in and of ourselves, as, as we just talked about, life is hard. How many of you get tired? I, the, the older I get, I get tired. I say, Carl, how are you doing this morning? He says, I, I, I was waking up hoping that today was Saturday because all I wanted to do was take a nap. <laughs> He realized it was Sunday. He had to come to church. He gets to come to church. I get tired. You get tired. And I'm not tired. I'm not just talking about, um, hey, I want to lay down and turn on something on the TV and veg out on the sofa. That's one kind of tired. But as we live our life, sometimes we get, um, I say it this way, we're, we're, um, we're spirit, soul, and body. Sometimes we get tired in our body. Right? We want to take a nap. We want to rest. I was up with the baby last night or the grandkids last night. I didn't get a full six, seven, eight hours sleep. I'm tired. I need a nap. That's one tired. Or I, I work real hard. I'm, I'm in construction and I had to do a bunch of stuff and I'm tired. That's in the body. The soul. We get tired in our soul. That speaks to our, our, our emotions, um, uh, our inward feeling. Um, it's different than our spirit. Our spirit is the same as our soul, our, our, our emotions and our inward being and our, our feelings and our desires and our dreams. But it's on the spiritual level, the spiritual part. What happens is that when we don't give ourselves to the Lord in the area of the spirit, praying and meditating and, and receiving from God, we get spiritually exhausted. And what happens is when we ex get exhausted, we are good for nothing. We have no power. I like to equate it this way. And, and this morning I, I've taken personal examples of stuff that I like since I'm preaching. Uh, but many of you know years ago when the model, uh, when the Tesla automobile company came out, it had what they call, they had a roadster for a little while, the very first one. Then they had a Model S that was, uh, readily available for the consumer. And for a number of months, about six months, I drove in, as a transportation chauffeur in my career, I, I drove a Model S. And uh, the Model S was great. I loved it. It was fast. Oh, yeah, zero to 60. Does it really do that in, in three seconds? Oh, yeah, it does. Watch. And uh, when no one was looking, well, I shouldn't say that online, but when the cops weren't around, I shouldn't say that online. Well, there's forgiveness. I talked about that. So I guess this is all okay. But I showed some of the clients that it went from zero to 60 in just a few seconds. I would hit that accelerator, boom. They would go back and away we went. Very quick. Um, and a beautiful car. Um, one of the problems with the car, I have to share this, but one of the problems with the car is a transportation car. It was a sedan and it was terrible uh, for transportation. I'd pull up and the client would get in. He'd be, be like Leslie or John or Carl, kind of tall and and um, kind of round like me. Anyway, he said, how do you get in the car? I, and before I could say anything, they're kind of crawling in the car head first and, and be, because it, it's a real tight fit. And uh, so I, I hear uh, ankles being twisted and elbows being bumped. And finally, I, I said, you know, I'm, I can't take any more of this. So... I pull up and I get the client. I says, um, I'm going to tell you how to get in the car. And they're looking at me. 
And they say, well, thank you, because it looks a little difficult. I says, all you have to simply do, swallow your pride, and you get in bum first. You go up, you back in, you get in, and then you swing your legs, and now you're good. <laughs> anyway, that's a side thing about the S. But this is what I found out about the Model S Tesla. Unless you plugged it in and powered the thing up, it was just a beautiful car. Oh, yeah, that's a fast car, but it was beautiful. I'll tell you what. One time, I talked to a client. He says, I forgot to plug my car in because he had a car at home. I forgot to plug my car in last night. And what happened? He couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't do anything the following morning, right? There was no power. He forgot to plug in. And uh, I talked to one, one chauffeur, and uh, he was out driving around, and, and uh, he needed to stop for coffee, needed to charge up. But he forgot, he, well, he didn't forget to do that. He pushed it too far, and the car ran out of power. Everyone understand, if you have an elect, all-electric car, you have to keep it powered up. And I use these um, analogies of the Tesla saying that uh, we have to stay powered up. Matter of fact, all of the car manufacturers nowadays are producing electric cars. I was watching the Masters Golf Tournament this weekend. And on came uh, the commercial, and on came this beautiful Mercedes Benz. I mean, it's gorgeous. And it's showing the dashboard and all the fancy things. And uh, at the end, the, 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 the tag is all, el it's, it, the, the, ta the, the, the tag is the vehicle is electric. Uh, the feeling is all Mercedes. The feeling is electric. Or, excuse me. The vehicle is all electric. The feeling is all Mercedes. And all of the manufacturers are going to vehicles. Will you drive an electric car? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Will your kids? More likely. Your grandkids? Probably. Don't ask me all the complexities of all of that. But that's where the automobile industry is, is going. But if you don't power up your vehicle, your vehicle is useless. That might be there. You can circle that. Um, the analogy is simple. If we don't have any power, we can't live that productive life. We're basically good looking. <laughs> and um, we, we are just sitting in the driveway doing nothing. We might be Christians, but we're not really accomplishing anything. So we, uh, we have to um, be real cognizant and aware of this. I like uh, the Psalmist David, what he says here in Psalms 20 and verse 6. And seven. Now, this I know. David's like taking a deep, deep breath. He's been through a lot. He writes this. This I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. And then he writes this. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Where did David get that saying? Some trust in chariots and some in horses. He read the scrolls. He knew the stories. And when the children of Israel went to the Red Sea to cross it, the Lord opened up the seas and they what? They crossed on dry land. We know this miracle. The Egyptians... And the Pharaoh were coming in hot pursuit. What were they on? Horses riding in chariots being pulled by the horses. And their, their confidence, the Egyptians' confidence, was in horses and chariots. Today, we have other things that make us um, think. It will provide us the necessary power the necessary strength, the necessary ability. I can go on and on about that and think about finances and the market. I've got my market over here, my money in the market over here and it's generating wealth. <laughs> Have you read your history books? The market at any time, for any reason, can go down and you can use, lose your wealth in a matter of hours. We've seen that history. So it's not the strength of our dollar or our business savvy or our understanding or our good decisions that produces power. 
It's, it's, it's God himself. We have to find a way to plug in. Paul writes it this way in Ephesians 1.18. I like this. Listen to this. I pray that the eyes of your I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul says there's power for you. There's power for me. If we want to have hope, to live a Christian life, we have to understand that and apply that to our lives. Otherwise, we're just that good-looking car in the driveway. We have to understand that it's, it's an uncomparably great power. It's greater than anything that, that the world has to offer. That power is the same, tying into the Resurrection Sunday. Paul writes this, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. In that old hymn, Up from the Grave He Arose, that was the hand of God reaching down into that tomb and raising to life Jesus, his only son for you and I, the incredibly power of God demonstrated on that resurrection morning, early in the morning, the very first verse I read there, early in the morning Mary went to the tomb, early in the morning, it had already happened the power of God was there demonstrated and then the disciples shortly found out, this morning you and I need to take, take uh, encouragement from the words of Paul that the same power his mighty strength that was exerted when he raised Christ from the dead, can dwell in us, can be in us. And um, for lack of time, um, I can't lift, list all the verses of the power of God. But that, that would be a great study. Sometime this week, things calm, calm down a little bit after the holidays. Open your Bible. Look in the back and look up at the word power and it'll show all the different verses. Or get a concordance out. Look on your phone, Bible app. BibleGateway.com, write in the word power and you'll have all these great verses and you can be encouraged. Well, number four, as I wrap up this morning, um, the wonderful possibilities of the resurrection. This is great. And I love this one. I love all four of them. I really handpicked them for us this morning. But number four, we can carry his presence. I so love this. I so love the topic of the presence of God. Presence can be understood by this idea. The state of existing, occurring, or being present in a person or thing. That's the actual definition of presence. And I, I like this, being present in a person. When we think about, um, we can carry the presence of the Spirit of God, God himself, it goes along with us. It's like you're going to work and you got your gray lunch box with your ham and Swiss sandwich and your Ritz crackers and your apple. Or you're going to school and you got your Spider-Man lunch box with your peanut butter and jelly and chips and juice cup. Wherever we go, we can take the presence of God. And out of all of these four uh, possibilities. I like this one the best because when I wake up in the morning, I say, Lord, this day's yours. And before I swing my foot down on the ground and head to go make a cup of coffee, I say, God, this is yours. I want your presence with me. <clears throat> it's not one of my verses and not even on my notes, but um, Moses is doing business with God. And uh, God says, I want you to do this and that. He says, I ain't doing nothing unless what? Your presence goes with me. And if you learn that, I'm telling you, your life will be so much better when you carry the presence of God. To have Jesus to do life with 
is immeasurable. I don't think I wrote that down, but I like that word, immeasurable. Having Jesus with you is immeasurable. Too often we try to do it on our own. I have a little story to tell the other day. Um, we're hanging out in the kitchen and I'm washing dishes or doing something. And uh, Joanne says, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for you and I'm really thankful for you. I, li- I really like having you around. Now, um, we celebrated 45 years the other day, as you knew. Um, that's not the first time she said that. Just a clarification. She said it probably numerous times every year, but it's one of the few times I'm even listening. And I, and I had, oh, she needs me. Oh, she likes me. Oh, I must be doing something good. And it brought a big smile to my face. But um, that same feeling that I had is the same feeling that Jesus has for you and we can have for him that, hey, I like having you around. You make me smile. You help me out. You're a great company. And uh, um, so this idea, not only are we pardoned, not only can we have peace, not only can we experience peace, power, but we can have a friend in Jesus. I want you to get that. I want you to put that in your pocket. I want you to say, you know, I love my wife. I love my husband. But let me tell you what. My wife uh, on the wrong hair is not at the top. And why am I not afraid to say that? Because on her wrong, I'm not on the top. It's her relationship with Jesus It's her friendship with Jesus and vice versa. It's my relationship with Jesus. It's Jesus walking with me. (laughs) Jesus never lets us down. He might delay a little bit, but he never lets us down. I'm messing up all the time with my wife. She's messing up all the time with me. We say things that aren't right. We do things that aren't right. And and, and, uh, that's that's a real problem. But with Jesus... He needs to be our friend. A friend is defined by the following. I like this. I think it's on your handouts. One attached to another by affection and esteem. I like those two words. One that is not hostile. I like that. (laughs) Have you ever had somebody that you thought they were your friends, but gee, you're a little hostile today, aren't you? Right? You're a little rough around the collar. You're a little harsh. Calm down, you know? Sometimes we're hostile to one another. A friend, one that favors or promotes something. I like showing favor, promoting, pushing forward, showing favor. That's what a friend does. And a friend is a favorite companion. I came across this. This can be used as me and Carl and Carl and I or Elijah and and Chrissy, his cousin, or Chrissy and Elijah, friends, this friend's. What are the qualities of good friends? They live with integrity. Carl's a man of integrity. He's a good friend. I can trust Carl. You can trust them. This is a friend. Put this also, as I'm reading it, in light of Jesus. Jesus is filled with integrity. You can trust Jesus. Dependability is their middle name. Carl says he's going to do something. He's going to do it. Dependability, I like that, is his middle name. (laughs) Uh, my grandson's name is Ace Danger. <laughs> Middle names mean something. Um, his sister's name is Ruby Rebel. Oh, my goodness. And is she? Yes, she is. We won't go there. But names mean something. And, and dependability is their middle name. They're loyal. Jesus is so loyal. They have empathy one for another. They're good listeners. Their confidence is contagious. Jesus was confident. You can do it. You'll have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome, and you can do it. His confidence is contagious, and it makes me say, yeah, it's hard right now. I can do it. Yeah, it's hard raising two nieces that are screaming 24-7 at the top of their lungs for nine months. I'm going crazy. You know the story. But I, I was able to do it, get through it, because walking with the Lord, walking with Jesus, he gave me confidence. And I like this last one. Friends are non-judgmental. That's worth a thousand bucks right there. Non-judgmental. That's Lord. Um, Some of you might remember this blockbuster children's movie, um, movies, plural, 
Toy Story. You remember Toy Story? If you had kids or grandkids, you know this story. We all remember Woody singing to Andy. Woody is the doll. Andy is the little boy. You've got a friend in me. I see Chrissy nodding her head. She wants to sing it out loud. Uh, on the way out, will you sing that for me, dear? You've got a friend in me. You've got a friend in me. I can't sing it. I'll get fired. When the road looks rough ahead, you've got miles and miles ahead. And from your nice warm bed, you just remember what your old pal said. Boy, you've got a friend in me. So good. Now, sometimes I have quotable quotes. I wrote this next thing down that I've emboldened on your, your handout. And then I wrote Bruce Falcom because I, I wrote it. I made it up. And I looked at that, and right before I hit print, I took my name off. I thought that was a little bit over the top. You know, here's Abraham Lincoln, quotable quote. <laughs> here's Ronald Reagan, quotable quote. Or, you know, your favorite author, quotable quote. Here's Bruce Falk. Anyways, but I still need to let you know I wrote this. Here it is. A real friend is more than a cleverly written verse on an overpriced Hallmark card. <laughs> It carries meaning, and over the years, it is proven time and again. A real friend is a picture of love without any hit, hint of a judgmental spirit. You can take that to the bank, circle that, and put a heart by it. Jesus promises to, our, to be our friend, and he even said it all the way to the very end, and I finish with the Scripture that we know out of Matthew 28 and 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We just completed uh, March for Missions, and we had the sanctuary covered with flags saying that the goal, the, the direction, the purpose of the church is to go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus challenges you and I to do this. Make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, and surely what I am with you to the end of the age. We can be pardoned, we can possess peace, we have access to power, and we can certainly carry his presence. Father, we thank you for the possibilities that we have this morning as we reflect on the risen Christ, what you have done in our lives and we rejoice in that. As we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday, what we call Easter, as we gather with family and friends and have a meal, let us not lose sight of the fact that you are a risen Savior and in that we have these possibilities. Bless now your people as we go from this place and we thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy your families.